like to start is just taking a broad look at where we are at the planetary level and how it influences the health of animals, including humans being one of those animals on the planet right now that are being intrinsically tied to this greater system of biology on the planet. And our industrial behavior over the last century has really put us in a very precarious place as a planet as well as a species. And the animals that we care for around us are really at in the eye of the hurricane, if you will. They take so much of the torrent of industrialization because of their interaction with the natural system that's more intimate than the kind of highly isolated human experience that we have in houses and offices and cars that are so separated from our nature in some bizarre ways that keeps us a little bit protected for what we've done to nature and our animals are down in it, they're sniffing it, they're running around in it. They're rolling in the chemical milieu of what we've created. And so what we've created is basically a system in which we see human life and human innovation as an oppositional force to nature. And so we see nature opposed to us. And in that, we have created a whole industry that is trying to push nature back so that we can have a presence within biology. And good examples of this are in our crop management or in our landscaping in the cities and parks and recreation and all spaces and all that, we're constantly spraying to reduce biodiversity. And so we're spraying to kill all of the weeds, all of the natural flora and fauna so that we can grow large lawns and put up large buildings that are not infested with insects or you know, rodents or whatever it is. We're constantly pushing nature back so we can have these sterile monoculture environments for what we call human civilization. And so in this way, in our belief that somehow human life was separate from nature and that comfort would come only when we isolated ourselves away from nature, we invented a world in which we are killing the diversity of the planet. And we do that quite literally with our mouse traps and our, our insecticides inside the houses and spraying the houses for termites or whatever we're doing. But we inadvertently do that as consumers through our food system, perhaps greater than any other system. And I would say probably number two behind that would be cosmetics. But those two industries of food and cosmetics really put the vast majority of chemicals into our immediate environment for our pets and for ourselves. Third behind that in more of the secondary environment toxicity is things like our transportation and energy sectors that put you know, carbon particulate in the air in the form of PM 2.5 and lots of things that get burned in the atmosphere that we would then secondarily breathe. But for those first points of contact, the food system and the agricultural environment around landscaping has put an enormous amount of herbicides into our environment. And herbicides and pesticides are symptomatic of a belief that the monoculture belief system is important. And a lawn that's clear of anything but Kentucky bluegrass is a good thing. Yeah. Or a park without weeds is a good thing. Or a golf course that's completely devoid of life outside of perfectly smooth green grass that's mowed at an eighth of an inch. You know, We've come up with these very odd abstract concepts of what we should do to the natural world around us. And the result is a loss of biodiversity in our soils as much as it is at the level of the flora, the plant life around us. And so in this marsh, we've managed at this point to denature or deplete the natural resources within soil systems in 97% of the world's arable soils or farmable soils. And so with 97% of arable soils now depleted or severely depleted of their functional nutrients and microbiome, we're literally losing the mechanics of biology on the planet. And so we're seeing a vulnerability emerge from the planet that's leading to this sixth great extinction kind of phenomenon. And yet that phenomenon has now led to the point that we're now estimating we're losing one species to extinction every 20 minutes. And so we're accelerating this mon monotony of life into a few species. And I think it's, we were hoping we would be the dominant species and we were hearing the world for that. We killed off all animals larger than ourselves at over hundreds of thousands of years of human behavior. So we've always been in opposition to things bigger than us. And we always wanted to be the dominant biology on the planet in some way or form. The results we didn't realize. The result is that we leave ourselves vulnerable to our own extinction because it turns out that 
our systems, our gut being the most obvious, but also our immune system, our neurologic system, even our liver metabolism and the way in which in our peripheral cells we create metabolic you know, fuel for energy to thrive all relies upon the very microbiome that was in those soils and in the soils of our gut have been de depleted through our herbicide and pesticide technologies. Currently with all those soils depleted, we also end up with a lot of other exposures. So we have herbicides that end up in water. And glyphosate is the most common herbicide, active ingredient in Roundup, which is the famous weed killer. But it's now used in over 95% of the herbicides on the market because it came off patent. So almost every weed killer you pick up, whether you're a consumer or a big ag producer, is going to have glyphosate in there. Glyphosate is a water-soluble toxin that functions as an antibiotic. And so it kills bacteria, fungi, all the way to the macro life, things like earthworms and that in the soils. A single spraying of glyphosate right before the wheat is harvested, for example, uh, can lead to a death of 50% of the earthworms within the soil layer. It'll be 100% of the worms on top can die, and a small percentage of the very deep living or earth dwelling creatures like the earthworms that die. So, total, you're looking at a 50% loss of macro life of the earthworms and such with one application. You do that year in, year out, and you start to lose the macro and micro life within soils. As a water soluble toxin, it doesn't stay there. Unfortunately, the water cycle is universal on the planet, and so that toxin then gets picked up with runoff from the farm and gets carried into streams and rivers and reservoirs and the like around it, at which point it can evaporate and end up in the air we breathe, ultimately in the clouds that then rain down on us. Current studies in the United States show that about 90, somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the air samples and water samples that we take from rain or rivers or have glyphosate in them now. So we're raining antibiotic, we're breathing antibiotic, and unfortunately, since 70 percent of water in plants or 70 percent of the plant is water by volume or mass, it's also got glyphosate in it. And so we're eating glyphosate in every bite of food really. It's very hard to find even organic foods that are completely devoid of Roundup. So we're in this environment where we're in constant state of depletion of microbiome diversity, leading us denuded and vulnerable to the world around us because the, in fact the immune system is not a human organ. The immune system is an environmental balance of an ecosystem between species. The most ideal immune system is 10,000 to 40,000 species in variety, just on the bacteria side of the equation. You have to start adding in protozoa and parasites and fungi, you're way up there in the hundreds of thousands of species that are likely interacting to create this balanced ecosystem in our bodies, around our bodies that we would call an immune system. And so we see that collapse of biologic function that is then paramount in its demonstration when we see pandemics occur. So pandemic of the last couple of years, the pandemics that have previously occurred, they tend to line up with massive toxic events. This current pandemic, for example, followed just months after the worst fires in human history recorded down there in Australia that buried the Earth's atmosphere in carbon particulate that's very good at carrying viruses. And those viruses then can enter the body carrying that carbon particulate with toxins like glyphosate, like carbon monoxide, other air pollutions to poison our bodies. And so the phenomenon of what we think of as viral syndromes or pandemics are actually phenomenon of environmental toxification through the binding of airborne viruses with carbon particulate and other toxins in our environment. And so we're gonna see this acceleration decade after decade of more pandemics, more crossing viral infections from avian source or swine source to human. And that's exactly what we've seen since 1974 when we introduced glyphosate to the food system We've seen somewhere around 12,000 different viruses go pandemic. Most of them don't get any press, but they go moving around the earth, bound to different toxins, other things that can cause damage to local or regional or global populations. So what I'm describing really is a phenomenon of loss of biology leads to an, a maladapted...